All right, I'm going to go ahead and show a CentOS Linux 7 installation. First, when you put in your CD and you boot from it, or if you're doing a virtual machine, once you boot from it, you're greeted with this screen right here. Um, you get to choose if you want to install CentOS 7, if you want to test the media, install CentOS 7, or troubleshooting. If you test the media, what it will do is to check through the disk and see if there are any errors. If you're doing a virtual machine, that doesn't make a lot of sense because you're not likely to have a scratch CD if you're installing from an ISO image. So we're just going to go ahead and directly install CentOS 7. So it then boots up and boots up into the, the installer. And the first thing you're greeted with is a language selection where you get to choose which language you want to use during the installation process. Um, I'm going to use English as my language. And so I will just go ahead and click right here, continue on with English. Next, I get to configure my network settings or and my other information. I like to configure the network settings first because that makes it easier to do other things as I move through it. So I'm going to call my machine server.example.com. And then I'm going to configure it with an IP address. So I go to this configure right here. I select IPv4 settings. I'm not going to give it a DHCP address because I don't want to do that. I want to manually configure a static IP address. So once I set the method to manual, I click add. I give an IP address. So I'll give it 10.230.101.123. And this will be a no max of 16. And the gateway is 10.230.0.1. And I'll go ahead and configure other information. If I know my DHs and my, my DNS servers, I will configure those. And then I will set a search domain. So because I'm in the example.com, it might make sense for me to do example.com as my search domain. That way, any other machines with a similar name, like www.example.com or maybe mail.example.com, would come up much easier. And I click save. Um, I also want to make sure I turn on the interface. If I don't turn it on, it makes it much more difficult to get other things done. So I turn it on. I can see my IP address and information all there. I click done. And I move back into this screen. Because I've configured my network address, I can also set up things like my network time servers. So I'll click my date and time. I decide I'm really in the Pacific zone. So I move over here and choose Los Angeles. My network time is set to on already, which is good. And then I can just click done. Um, keyboard, I can leave the same. My language support, I can leave the same. What I have to decide now is um, what I want to do with my installation. So I want to do a, a desktop installation. So I select this and currently it's set to a minimal install. If I do a minimal install, all that will be installed on here is my base system, um, a non-GUI platform. It's perfect for setting up servers if you don't want to have a GUI messing up your memory usage. Now, I do want a GUI, so I'll click the GNOME desktop. I can select other things over here if I want, other packages, but I've decided I don't I don't care. I'm just going to stick with just a GNOME desktop. I can install other things later. Now it's going to do a check to figure out if everything's okay. And then once it's done, um, I can move on. The installation media, I'm still going to use my local, local media, which is my ISO image um, or DVD drive. And now I need to decide the installation destination. If I click this thing, my options are um, it wants to first tell me this is the hard drive I can use. Um, and I can either choose to automatically configure partitioning or I can configure partitioning myself. If I automatically configure partitioning, it will choose to use LVM and you know, create some partitions that will uh, do a fairly effective use of my space. Um, and then you can just click done or I can manually configure it. So I'm going to manually configure it just so you can see. 
I click done. And then I get to choose. Do I want to use LVM? LVM basically means that I have one giant partition created that will um, be marked as LVM and then I will create other partition type pieces inside of it. Um, it allows me to expand and shrink partitions and even have partitions that span or actually uh, volumes that span over multiple drives. Um, and so LVM is very nice, but I'm going to go ahead and do standard partitions. Standard is limited back to the old MBR style thing where you had um, only you know, four partitions, but you could have one of them be used as an extended partition to have other smaller partitions. So let's go ahead and do that. So then I need to click plus, and I'm going to create mount points. So the most important mount point is I need a slash drive, slash directory. Um, and so I'm going to add that one last because it's going to use up all the remaining space. I'm going to create first, before that, a boot. And um, the boot will contain the kernel and the initial RAM disk and other information in there, my um, bootloader information. And I'm going to make this one 512 megabytes, which should be fine until I start adding more kernels, and then I'll run out of space, and it'll be a problem. But I'll go ahead and do that now. Um, it automatically creates it, um, creates information. Um, I can add a label if I want. Um, I don't need a label. Um, sometimes people like to have a label that matches the name of the partition. Um, it's currently decided it wants to use XFS for the file system. I can change that and say, well, maybe I like exe3 instead. And update the settings. And then I can go add another one. Um, I need to have a swap partition. Standard um, idea was to have twice as much swap as your memory, but because memory has gotten so big, um, it's not very common to need twice as much swap as memory or RAM. And so you want to have something realistic. Um, swap is something you want to have, but you never want to use. You want your machine to not use your swap. You want it to use just RAM. Um, I'm going to go ahead and set it at one gigabyte because I figure that will be enough for what I need. Um, once again, if I want to, I can add a label. Uh, I don't need to. It's not necessary. Um, you can see that it is marked as a swap partition. I can update the settings here. And I'll add another one. Um, this one, there are lots of other things I could do. I could add a home directory if I wanted. This is normally common if you plan on rebuilding your system later or changing things and you might want to keep your home directories around when you change things and reinstall. Um, user is if you plan on having user files that change a lot um, and you want to limit the amount of space it consumes or make sure things don't happen there. Um, similar thing with var. Var, if you run out of space because of logs or someone's attacking your system, it might fill up your entire system so you might want your var separate. Um, I'm not going to do any of those. I'm just going to go with a straight slash partition. And I'm going to leave this blank. And then it'll use up all the remaining space. So I just out the mount, at the mount point. I'm going to leave it the standard um, XFS. I might put a label in here because I like those sometimes. And then I will click done. At this point, I'm ready for everything. I will accept my changes. And then I am ready for the installation. So when I click the begin installation, the first thing that happens is it starts by formatting file systems. I mean, it builds the partitions, starts formatting them, and starts copying packages over. And while it's doing that, I can set my root password. So you want to set your root password to be something good. And if you don't set a good root password, it will not like it. So I have a nice short, weak password. Since the password you provide is weak, you have to press done twice to confirm it. So if I keep this weak password, I click done twice, and then I'm done. It then wants me to create a user account. And this user account will usually be your, your main user you'll log in as. Normally, you will not want to log in as root. You want to log in as a different user. So 
So I will create a user account and this is going to be um, Bob. That's good enough. Bob. Now I have this option to make this user administrator. If I check this box, then I can use the su command in order to run commands and run things as administrator. If I don't check this, then if I want to run things as root, I either have to log in as root or use the su command to switch over to root to do things. I'm going to go ahead and check this box for this user. Normally I wouldn't want to make all the users administrators, but I will make this user administrator. Once again, I'm going to create an, a password, so I'll make this password Bob and Bob. I will then click Done. Now, one thing we have here is I could also, at this point, instead of just doing creating user accounts, I could click Advanced, and I could manually set up other things. Um, the wheel group is usually for people who are part of the administrator groups and things like that. Um, so I'm just going to save that, leave it alone and click done and done twice because it's a weak password. At this point, all I have to do is just wait for it to finish installing the operating system. So I will go ahead and pause for a moment. All right, the system has finished installing the software. Now it's performing the post installation setup tasks. Um, this would include things like setting the root password and creating the user account. This takes uh, just a little bit of time. And once it has completed this, I am then asked to go through and reboot the system because it has to boot up into the newly installed system. The system is not quite ready for me at that point. It still needs to go through a few more configuration options. I need to accept the the license agreement and other things like that. Now reboot the system and the system because it has a file system in place then can boot up into this. At this point, I have to accept the license. I can read it or just accept it. Click done. Then I click finish configuration, which is really not the end. It's kind of right before the end. The next thing is to ask if I want to have KDump enabled. KDump takes up a little bit of memory, but if you are a kernel developer, it might be useful to have memory saved so you can figure out what happens if you crash. I don't need it, so I was just unenable it and press forward. It then asked me to reboot my system. I reboot it and start over again. Um, this time it should boot up all the way to my GUI. Um, it will have a the login screen, and then I will see my user Bob displayed. And I can log in as Bob. Um, before I log in, I could have chosen not listed and chosen root right here. Um, but I'm going to choose Bob and log in as Bob. Once Bob logs in, it has this welcome screen where I can choose once again language. This is the default language for my environment here. I just press next, next for the, that. Click next for existing because I don't really care about that. Start using Linux and then it'll pop up the help screen that then gives me information if I am confused and not sure what to do. So I can close this and now I have my desktop and I'm ready to go. And that is installing Linux.